Good evening, everyone. Liz Lerman is a choreographer, performer, writer, educator, and as we're about to all experience, a very insightful speaker. She has been described by the Washington Post as the source of an epical revolution in the scope and purposes of dance art. Her aesthetic approach spans the range from abstract to personal to political. She founded the Liz Lerman Dance Exchange in 1976 and cultivated the company's unique multi-generational ensemble into a leading force in contemporary dance until 2011, when she handed the artistic leadership of the company over to the next generation of dance exchange artists. Now she is pursuing new projects with fresh partnerships, recently having spent a semester at Harvard University as artist in residence. Other projects involve Jawali Zoller of Urban Bushwoman, a company we've been uh, lucky enough to host here on the Dance House stage in Vancouver, an investigation of the impact of war on medicine, and comic book structures as applied to narration and performance. Hiking the Horizontal, Field Notes from a Choreographer, is the title of Liz's collection of essays, which was recently published. And Liz has been the recipient of numerous honors, including a 2002 MacArthur Genius Grant Fellowship and a 2011 United States Artist Ford Fellowship. Her work has been commissioned by the Lincoln Center, American Dance Festival, Harvard Law School, and the Kennedy Center, among many others. Her most recent performance, The Matter of Origins, examined the question of beginnings through dance, media, and innovative formats for conversations. And with that, I give you Liz Lerman. this out. Uh, thank you. In fact, I want to thank all the people that Am thanked. And thank you, Am, as well. Um, it's nice to see you all. Um, nice to see some of the students I was with today. Glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I really like Nobel Week, which we just finished, right, when they give out the prizes. Um, I, partly I like it because um, I like to listen to what they say. You know, they give them like 10 seconds to talk. And uh, they've, of course, done that work that they got the prize for, for, you know, 50 years or something. And I'm always interested in how people come to the essence of what they feel their life has been. And one year I was driving, and I don't even know who the person was on the radio, but they had just gotten the Nobel Prize. And uh, he said uh, he got it. Um, for rattling around in other people's universes, which I thought was kind of interesting. And um, not that I'm going to get a Nobel Prize, <laughs> but I do rattle around a lot in other people's universes. And I have found a little bit like when you burnish a pebble or something, that taking artistic practices with me into unusual places has... I hope affected the places I'm in, has definitely affected the art and the way I see it. And that's a little bit about what I'd love um, to talk to you about tonight. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to get my notebook open. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I have a little bit of a practice of, of wandering in different universes, partly because of my, my parents. And um, I, I decided, in thinking about what to talk about tonight, that I, w I would back up a little bit into some of the, my earlier experiences, partly because when I'm on campuses, um, I just don't want people to think I was born this way. You know, like there's a lot of things that happen to a person that make you change or become the person you are becoming. And uh, so I gave myself a chance to sort of reflect. And it's also because I'm on the west coast of North America, which is where my parents met. But um, my, my father was um, a labor organizer, a civil rights agitator, a total radical, who um, absolutely believed that your job in the world was to help change it. And that's what he said, like, I mean, every time I saw him, morning, noon, and night, you know, what have you done today? On the other hand, my mother, um, believed in art. She was an isolationist. She preferred to spend time in her garden. She was a real modernist. The house was completely white, and all objects were kind of square and beautiful. 
And the, the two, it was like a, it was amazing to move between their worlds and what they believed in. Because while my father was telling me, change the world, my mother was saying, you know, if you're going to be an artist, you're going to have to stick up for yourself. So you better just understand yourself. Just really dig in. Be different. And don't worry about what anybody thinks. That's kind of a, a wonderful, wonderful ping-pong match to grow up in. And um, I often think that the way I've come to organize my life is simply a reconstitution of that world, those worlds that they, um, they helped me come to terms with. <clears throat> I think um, the word that came to me, though, when I was uh, musing today about this was um, the idea of belonging. Because in my father's version of belonging was, you belong by creating community, by making connections, by working arm in arm with people to understand the needs that are around you. And then you got the right to belong. My mother's idea about belonging was probably something like, you belong to yourself. I, I raised it to myself today, partly because of the dinner I had last night with some wonderful people here in this room, and the ongoing discussion about the relationship between artistic practice and community-based practices. And how is it that we find our belonging in that? And um, as I talk today, maybe, maybe you'll think a little bit about that for yourself. I know that um, I yearn to belong, and I keep myself separate. And I wonder about that, and I wonder how that plays out for me. So I was uh, trained classically. My first form of dance was classical, and uh, I was extremely serious about becoming a ballerina. Um, I consider that ballet training my orthodoxy, and I consider it um, something wonderful and something of a bit of a disaster. But <clears throat> I wanted it more than anything else. And uh, my wonderful parents managed to figure out a way for me to study it very, very, very seriously, even though I was living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is was a not a hotbed of a lot of artistic teachers, but they found me an amazing woman. And then I went uh, to a summer camp where you could study eight hours a day called the National Music Camp, which I did and loved. And in my 14th summer, not, I was my third summer at camp, but my 14th year, uh, we went uh, to dance for President Kennedy. Mrs. Kennedy had a, um, had a, uh, a, a beautiful stage put on the mall. And um, the National Music Camp Orchestra and the National Music Camp dancers performed, and then we had a meal in the White House. And was, of course, it couldn't have happened today, uh, as the government was shut down. But it, at, at that time, <laughs> that, that was not happening. And um, it was it was amazing. And uh, I left and went back home to Milwaukee, which at that time was in the middle of the most intense uh, beginnings of the civil rights movement. Milwaukee is a northern city, completely segregated by housing patterns. And um, what, my, what happened that fall is that my, uh, my parents pulled me out of school. Now, the only time I was allowed to be out of school, we were really, I mean, you had to be really sick in my family to stay home, because education, education, education. We missed on the Jewish holidays, because in those days, school, public schools went on even if it was a Jewish holiday. So I was allowed to stay home on the Jewish holidays, which I kind of loved. But um, this was different. This was not a Jewish holiday. This was something called a freedom school. And uh, it was a form of protest. And we were taken out of public school, and we were all sent to these schools on other parts of the city, where we would spend time looking at the political and social issues around the civil rights movement. So. In the daytime, I would go to freedom school. And in the evening, when I went to my dance class, I would learn the bluebird, which is what I was studying at that time, which is a beautiful little variation, which I still can do, at least with my arms. And 
that's the thing about movement, right? It gets in you and then it doesn't go away. It just doesn't. Well, I had, I just was, uh, I didn't know what to do about that. That is to, to say, what was happening to me in this freedom school was a complete, total, not total change, because of course we talked about these things at home, but it was very different to be in class with these kids and be thinking about these things, and then to go and study that particular form. And I think I had the first big crack in my system, because I didn't understand how I could be a dancer in a world of the bluebird. Now, at that time, nobody was able to tell me that there were things like the green table. No one, no one was able to help me understand that there might be a means by which I could live in both those worlds. It really felt to me like one or the other, and so I quit dancing. <clears throat> Not for very long. I don't know how many of you have quit dancing in this room and started up again. <laughs> Probably many. Um, but it was a moment of extreme terror for me. And uh, you know, I think now, I think about young people and the, just the incredible passion that we have for, for our work. That was a big turning point for me. And I want to go back now to this question of belonging and to this question of my father and his, the implication of being in the world. And the idea that big movements can have a huge impact on you. I just heard somebody talk about a bunch of, again, Nobel laureates and, uh, in between the wars and how the, the coming of the Second World War forced them into becoming the people they became. And I just want to concur that um, it isn't all about the self. It's just not. Things happen. I was broken hearted. I just can't describe it in any other way. I was brokenhearted. And I'm thinking um, what you asked me earlier, Jim, today about what, what do I think now, right? What is the world like now? So I felt strongly that after I quit, that I was stupid to quit, that dancing was the thing, the most important thing. So I began to wonder how could I live in those two worlds, right? Rattling in other people's universes. How, how is it even possible? So now come forward, come forward. Um, a lot of things happen. Married, divorce, three colleges, blah, 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 blah. Lots of things. And um, I'm now in my mid-20s. I am determined, determined to figure out still this dance life, living in, living, uh, in Washington, D.C. When um, my mother diagnosed with a horrific form of cancer and I went home to be with her for the last couple of months of her life. And in that time frame, um, I was beginning to imagine myself as a choreographer, beginning to. I had moved into contemporary forms. I had um, dancing around with, as you do, with different people who are a little bit ahead of you. <clears throat> and as my mother was dying, she did something which now I've spent enough time around lots of older people. And I understand if you're lucky enough to know that you're dying, this is something that you do which is you have a chance to reflect on your life, and you can, uh, she did a lot of recalling of just bringing people into our house, but not literally, I mean, she was just talking about them, and I had this vision that they were just floating, floating, floating in the house, and for some reason I thought of them all as old, even though my mother was only 60 at the time. And so after her death, I went back to Washington, and I decided <clears throat> to make a dance about what I had been through, and, um, now, incidentally, I didn't call that dance therapy. It didn't occur to me to say, oh, I'm going to do something therapeutic for myself. I said, I am going to make a dance about what has happened to me. And all the rigor of everything I possibly knew by that point, I would apply in making this dance, except for one thing. I needed some old people to be in it because I had this vision of these floating old people and I really wanted them. So I went looking, and I'm not gonna go into this, you can read about it in the book, but just to say that I eventually found a place where old people lived. 
uh, and I asked if I could teach there, and they needed entertainment one night a week, so they said fine. And I went into a place which housed not just old people, but mentally retarded people, which was the term we used at that time, and poor people who could not afford private care. They housed about 400 people. And when I arrived to teach my first night, I had about 50 people. And honestly, by the, by the time I was there for a month, we would sometimes get as many as 100 people in there wanting to dance. They were just so hungry, hungry, hungry to, uh, well, to be entertained, which is what they called me, the entertainer. But um, it was a participatory thing. That is to say, I, I danced for them that first night, but then I got them also all dancing, and my life changed in the next 10 years while I tried to figure out what could happen between us. I consider that moment a personal moment. So if on the one hand this big giant civil rights movement caused this thing and the nature of belonging and what my father was pushing, on the other hand this very private, private thing with my mother totally turned me around. And so obviously I was saying to myself, the self matters as does these big ideas. And I began to say to myself, how can I live in this world? And here's what I came up with. Now, I got some help because I was under some stress at the time by how people were viewing what I was doing. So I had, by that time, formed a dance company. We were beginning to be, we were touring and doing stuff. And that would go something like this. Some people would say to me, okay, the dancing and performing that you're doing at the Kennedy Center, we'll put that up here. And... The stuff you're doing at the Roosevelt Hotel for Senior Citizens, which was the place that I was teaching at, we'll put that down here. Okay. So this is like really good. It's high art. Look how high it is. <laughs> it's good. And this stuff down here, well, I guess if you have to. Yeah, go ahead. Or people said this. Right? They said, wait, 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 wait. That stuff you're doing in the, in, in the, in the uh, Roosevelt Senior Centers, that is really great work. That's so important, Liz. It's so good for them you're doing that. But I don't know, why are you still working on the concert stage? It's old, it's white, it's male. It's, uh, don't, don't give it up. It's elitist. What do you think? I mean, how would you choose? Well, actually, why would you choose? Why? So I did this and said, no, it's like this, which, as I've often said, is easy to do with my hands. <laughs> okay, done. done. But actually, it really was the truth of my experience, and here's where I so valued my mother's words. And it's what we worked on in class today a little bit. You're having an experience, notice it. That's the thing that counts. And my experience was that these things were... Not always equal, but definitely equally interesting and challenging and curious, and that they informed each other constantly. And sometimes they were far apart, and I'd have to really travel a lot to get there. But sometimes if you make a circle, you know, they're right next to each other. It's not really that different. <clears throat> I started to think about this about everything, that we constantly do this with, oh, something like nurture and rigor, or individual and collective, or um, collaboration and being by yourself. Or, I mean, we, we're just constantly setting up these either-or situations. And again, my experience almost always was, well, wait a minute. If I do this, I can see the value all across the spectrum. But it's way deeper than thinking of it as a spectrum thinking or as a continuum. It's way deeper and way more difficult. Because if you're really going to live this way, you have to actually try to respect what's at the other end of that spectrum. You have to really look and see what's in there. So for example, you could say at this point in my life, I thought contemporary dance was up here. And remember that ordeal of ballet was down here. Well, when you flip it, you say, no, here's a spectrum. Well, then what am I going to do about that classicism? How do I feel about it? Turns out when my mom was dying, the only time I left the house was to go to ballet class. I hadn't been to ballet class for 10 years. I was so happy to go to ballet class. 
Why? Because all the rules were clear, everything was straightforward, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. I was so happy, and what was really interesting is I was really good at ballet while my mother was dying, which I still to this day don't quite understand, but my legs were up here, I was like turning like crazy. In fact, they asked me to join the company, which just completely cracked me up. But, but it helped me understand that there is a reason and a time in your life and a power in an orthodoxy. And it actually is possible to respect what's at the other end of the spectrum. If you pay attention, and if it's not, mm, if it doesn't go unexamined, I mean, you have to examine it. It's not accepting the whole orthodoxy. It's just saying there are times when it may count. Okay. So I just want to say a little bit more about this, much more about it in the book, which is called Hiking the Horizontal, because this has become a way in which not only just to manage this idea of being in multiple universes, but to manage um, what I consider to be the, the, the way the world is shifting anyway, which is that I think we learn most of our behaviors in a hierarchical world. And we're trying to live in a world that's more like this, especially you, the younger folks, because that's the way the world has shifted, I'm, I think. So just by way of example, if we take something like um, <clears throat> standards, standards in art, for example. In this world, this is good, this is not good. It's just a given. And when I was coming up as a choreographer, what was really good was if you could make up movement that nobody had ever seen. Now that was really good. That was like the best thing. So okay, I become artist in residence at Children's Hospital in Washington, which I got to do for five years. Once a week, I would go in with a piano player. We'd roll the piano through the hospital. We'd stop in different rooms in different places, and we would do these incredible little dances. And sometimes the families and the doctors and nurses would come in, and there'd be these little gatherings. <clears throat> OK, I want to be good. I'm like a good choreographer. So what's my standard when I'm in children's hospital? Make sure that they do the most unusual thing in the world? I don't think so although they did do really interesting movement. I saw movement from those kids that you would not have seen, and that was the choreographer's eye at work, because you know they might be like this in the bed and just be able to do that. It's pretty interesting. But it turned out what they needed was, um, they needed to be able to move their bodies for as long as possible without harming themselves. They needed to have a way to think about their body that wasn't bad, it was actually good. Their families needed to actually see them have bodies that weren't being pricked and poked. That's what they needed. So I had to go into my choreographer's toolbox and pull out something that actually I hadn't worked on. I hadn't worked on, well, how long can you sustain movement over time that's gentle but keeps going and is interesting and keep a group of people of all different ages dancing together? I hadn't tried that. So I guess what I'm suggesting is, in, in the most interesting way, if you start thinking about standards and what's important, you realize that on the horizontal, you want to be excellent all the time. But the excellence changes. It's not the same excellence. Whereas in this world, you can be asked to be the same excellent over and over and over again. I got really excited about this because I realized after I'd spend time in children's hospital and go back to rehearsals, I was actually a better choreographer. And this continues to be true. That is to say, for example, the work I've been doing with scientists in the last decade, <clears throat> a lot of people say to me, but Liz, you're just in service to the scientists. They, the scientists like to get help on how to visualize some of, their, uh, some of the things they're working on in the laboratories. And so people will say, well, Liz, how is that? You're just in service. Well, first of all, I say, uh, what's your point? Like, is it so bad to be in service? Actually, being in service is like money in the bank. I don't mean it literally, although literally it is. <laughs> it literally is an economic model. But what I mean more is that by giving, you get. A lot. What do you get? Well, in this case, now talking about the scientists, as a choreographer, 
one of the things you get is you get challenged to be absolutely specific with the movement. They don't want ambiguity. Uh -uh. They don't want ambivalence. They want to know that this means a cell is going to do whatever, is going to oscillate or whatever. Maybe your skin's crawling now if you're a choreographer. I don't know. Because, you know, really, the standard is we're going to let everybody decide what it is. We're not going to exactly say what it is. We're never going to actually say what it is. When it's kind of interesting to say what it is. And remember, if you do this, you get to say what it is over here, and you get to not say what it is over here. Do you see my drift? That way, you get to push yourself and try things and experiment and be of service, which will push the artist and the art form. So that's what I mean. We learn, our, we learn a lot of our behaviors here, but we're trying to figure out what they are over here. And we could go on and we could talk more about that, but I'm going to um, leave the sort of theoretical for a minute and just um, move to a little bit of some clips so you can get an idea about what I'm talking about. So um, <clears throat> I thought it would be, again, interesting to see some of the early work, and I want to, I want to start with, um, it's a clip from, uh, we were approached by, um, two museums that were doing exhibits on gerontology. And they realized once they had built the exhibits that they were boring, and so they asked if uh, we would help them. And they proposed this structure, which actually was an interesting structure. I had never done it before. They had us bring older people that we had worked with on a, ver a variety of our residencies to one place. They f we filmed duets with company members and the older people, and then they told stories, and then they made the edits. And these ran on a loop. There's seven of them, and they ran on a loop. I'm going to show you one of them. Uh, it's a guy who we met when we did a project on the, at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, which was an 18-month-long project where the company went back and forth to Portsmouth, working all over the shipyard, and eventually uh, did a one-week-long festival with two shows a day, one on the yard, one off the yard, and a thousand people in the park the last day to um, dance together and to celebrate the, yard, the, the shipyard and all that it had done. Um, so this, the guy you're going to see is Charlie Lawrence. He is the um, director of crane maintenance in the shipyard. And he's dancing with Vincent Thomas, who's a wonderful choreographer in Baltimore now. And I'm going to attempt to do this. And if I'm unsuccessful at this, Mark is going to come and help me. So let's see if we can do this. And I guess what I want to point out is remembering that you have this opportunity to stretch yourself. It means that you can be simple if you want to be simple. It means you don't have to be like whatever you feel the rules are of the trade. You, you, you get a chance to actually experiment a little bit. Okay, let's see. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that. I am the director of crane maintenance at Postal Naval Shipyard. I've been married for 32 years, the father of two children.
hard-headed than I am. So no, son, I am the master. <laughs> I guess I would ask you to think for a minute, who is in the museum? Who's coming upon this? What's their sense of dance and movement? And again, this question of what, uh, what do we make for whom and when? And I'm gonna uh, come back to that when we talk a little bit about creative research because I think the power of thinking about different audiences and different formats is such an incredible way to help us um, I guess stay varied in the work that we make. So I want to show you one other thing that's from this same period. It's a really complicated piece. It was called Faith and Science on the Midway, and it uh, looked at um, the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, which was the first time we had an anthropological wing at the fair, at these fairs. And basically, uh, what the anthropologists, it was a pretty new field, and what they were interested in doing was um, uh, putting uh, they brought tribes from, mostly from the Philippines, 27 of them, which they put on display in order of um, what they thought was most civilized. They brought, um, they had a, a pygmy named Oda, Beng Oda Benga, who was also on, on display, as was a, uh, one of the references I found was Shifra, the Palestinian Jewess. <clears throat> So you're going to see a little clip of the way I wanted to approach this. You're going to hear a lot of text, and that's what I want to get into a little bit, is what, what happens when we start using language and text in relationship to movement. Um, yeah, and I might, I might rush through a little bit of it uh, uh, and then talk to you a little bit about it afterwards. Okay. Barkers, yeah, George around me, everybody. I'm gonna tell you all about Dr. Walter's malaria, A U N Q. Q. Here I go now. Hmm. Uh huh. Oh, I'm bad. Dr. Walter's malaria, A U N Q. Q. Oh yeah. Here you go now. Hmm. 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 Oh, is a specific remedy for all diseases due to malaria suffering and anything else that ails you. Ha! <laughs> I feel good now. I knew that I would now. It will get rid of headaches, backaches, head lice, license problems, license plates, athlete's feet, pig's feet. I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> oh, listen, I know I'm right about that, and before I take that back, I'm going to add some more to it. Huh. Any disease, ha! <laughs> due to malaria suffering, ha, can be eradicated. You too can be healed and cleansed. All I can say is Dr. Walter's malaria ague and chill cure. Tu si que esta bien chévere, oye. There is no reason why you should suffer with typhoid fever, romantic fever, low self-esteem. Well, if you think the line was long to get into this theater, you should see the line out in front of the tent that possesses Shifra, the Palestinian Jewess, and her dancing cohorts, Princesses Raja, and Raji, oh, those princesses. They don't possess the brainy bravura of, say, say, our president. My memory is that the European Southern brunettes are not square-headed, but long-headed. The medium-tinted Middle Europeans are square-headed, and the Northern blondes, again, long-headed. But they do have strong mandibular joints. Now this comes from sleeping in the same tent and drinking water from the same pail as their camels. It's an inbred thing we're just looking into. So without further ado, Princesses Raja and Raji and their headliner, Shifra, the Palestinian Jewess. The letter Shin symbolizes Moses with his hands outstretched and his head between them. It can also depict a bonfire dancing flames spiraling upwards towards the heavens. The sound of hay is a mere exhalation of breath. It requires little effort, no movement of mouth, tongue, or lips. The hess looks like a Taurus grove with a roof over it. To help me with my research at the fair, I have an assistant. 
Miss Gibson. My memory is that the European Southern brunettes are not square-headed but long-headed. The medium-tinted Middle Europeans are square-headed. The Northern blonde? Oh, yeah. Hey! Yo, the smallest letter represents the metaphysical. In smallness lies essence. Noon in itself implies an outlook of hope. They are delightful. <laughs> Gather round me, everybody. I'm gonna tell you the story of Ota Benga. Not in my words, not in the words of the pygmy Ota Benga, but in the words of Dr. Samuel P. Burner, the man who brought Ota Benga all the way from Africa to the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. By the way, Uh-huh. They are worth the five cents he charges to show them. Yes, they are. Oh, what's up? Oh. Uh-huh. Oh. He's the only genuine pygmy in America now. He looks harmless and playful, and the first instinct is to pet him. But ah, ah, just look at those sharp teeth. They are as sharp as any wild animal. He belongs to a tribe who filed their teeth down for the sole purpose of tearing up human flesh. He's around four feet, nine inches tall, between 17. Don't nobody write me no his age. I know I'm right about that. And before I take that back, I'm going to add some more to it. Huh. When asked how to pronounce his name, it sounded like he said Oberbank. But the Reverend Dr. Samuel P. Verner said it's pronounced Hotabenga. He brought him from a tribe that was holding him hostage for five, you don't hear me, I said five dollars. I'm not on by the five dollars, you all. That's a little bit from Faith and <clears throat> Science on the Midway. I think the reason I wanted to show that today is that um, it's the first time I began to try to figure out really using historical research. So, for example, the chair dance that you saw, that's taken directly from microfiche in the Library of Congress. That's a little tiny clip of something that occurred on the Midway at that fair. Uh, you get to hear, that's uh, Teddy Roosevelt speaking. That is what Teddy Roosevelt talked about. He actually was fairly enlightened as our presidents go around race, but he was busy measuring the sizes of heads, just like everybody was at the turn of that century. Um, the language is entirely the language of um, as, as Andy tells you, the, the, the guy who brought Oda Benga over. But maybe the most interesting thing to me in the clip as I look at it now is the use of the same gestures twice, right? Which is kind of a postmodern trope now. That is to say, we see that often. The idea that meaning is built, you let an audience in on it, you tell them this means that, and then you change it in this case through text, although there are other ways to do it. And then you get to bring together the multiple worlds. It went on, it's, I mean, you see it a lot in a lot of people's work, not just mine, but it was one of the things that drew me most powerfully to text, was as a way to bring people in, a way to be able to explore difficult ideas like that. Um, so I know that we're, uh, the, uh, the time is moving along, and I wanted to get into one other thing. How are you doing? Are you okay? Can I talk a little bit longer and then bring Jim in and we can do questions and stuff? Are you doing okay? Can, yeah? Does anybody have a, 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 it's okay? I'll go a little bit more. Because now that I'm into research, I'd like to talk to you about this, okay? So um, uh, this book, Hiking the Horizontal, came out uh, a little bit ago, and I'm happy to say that uh, the publisher's bringing it out in paperback. And they said I could write some new essays. And so I took on this question of creative research, which is actually in the first book, but it's um, the last thing I wrote, and I'm not very happy with it. I'm still working on the idea. So I want to actually read to you uh, a little bit about what I'm trying to get at with creative research, and then I think we can, uh, maybe I'll show you a little bit of the new piece, and then we'll pop together, okay? So, all right. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. It's very kind of you. <clears throat> a 
Okay. Um, when did my interest in creative research begin to take shape? It might have been in 1975 when I applied my personal experiences with the death of my mother to the choreographic challenge of making dance about it, deriving insights from the doctors, the medicine, and the spiritual conflict among the rabbis that accompanied her illness. I have to do this. It might have been a year later when I began to notice that teaching dance to the elderly required me to know something about them before I initiated the movement classes. For example, they knew more than I did about their own bodies, and I had to learn various ways of interviewing them to uncover this knowledge so that we could work together. My interest was strengthened in the 1980s with dances about Civil War reenactors, the defense budget, the history of Russia. By the 1990s, I was engaged in large-scale community projects in which the archives of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, as well as its, as its contemporary workforce, became the focus of our work. So did the story of, of the anthropologists in the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, etc. It was during the making of this piece that I found an old microfilm of a midway dancer that we sampled. By the turn of the millennium, I had turned my own attention to a series of community engagements around the country in which cities and rural towns alike responded to this question, what are you in praise of, with dances made from their own stories and their own self-images. And then I went into the science labs, first with biologists and geneticists, and then with physicists, and now with neuroscientists, psychologists, and others engaged with PTSD, TBI, and other acronym injuries of our returning veterans, scheduled to premiere this spring. This last, decade has play, this last decade has placed much of my work on campuses, and that is why and how I have begun to see the particular value of creative research and its potential use as an engine of learning, a vehicle for change in higher education, and a source of deep pleasure and influence in the world of the mind. It also brings to light, and this is really important to me, it also brings to light a side of the artistic process that has been disguised as less important and because of the individual nature of its practice, hidden from critical discussion and shared interpretation. By this I mean our, well, I'll, I'll finish the reading and then see if it's clear in the, in the writing. At its simplest, creative research is the processes by which artists prepare themselves and their materials in order to make something. In Europe, the idea of creative research is understood as the actual activity of rehearsing. In North America, it seems more often to be the investigation of ideas that leads writers, choreographers, playwrights, and visual artists to comprehend their subject and the way in which they then subject that concept to abstraction. For many creative researchers, the data and catalyzing ideas they seek may come from books, the internet, conversations through interviews, and often by stalking scholars and practitioners in other fields. What makes it different from other kinds of research? Often artists don't start out with a hypothesis to prove, but rather a line of inquiry that unfolds. Part of the research process is the variety of paths that are taken and the speed with which some are abandoned. Of equal interest is the fact that artists have a variety of audiences, formats, and peers with which to engage, and I think this is one of the biggest differences and one of the things we have so much to contribute to universities. I'll say that. The, there, <clears throat> these are, in fact, key ingredients in the transdomain process, and they change the nature of the research questions, the way in which the activity is rigorous, and the final outcomes of the research itself, as I mentioned. If my audience is museum going, goers going into a gerontological exhibit and the thing can only be three minutes long, the format is different, the audience is different, and therefore the thing that emerges is different. This is fantastic. It's not always a, a peer journal that is going to get the information. These three elements, audience, format, and peers, are useful for examining not just how they affect the nature of creative research, but also how they inform the paradigms by which academic research is conducted. If these elements, and I'm sure there are others that are now so embedded that they are subsumed into the very definition of research, 
we're challenged within the structures of research, I believe we would begin to see new ways of asking questions, new forms in which to portray the outcomes, and possibly new outcomes entirely. A major difference between scientific and creative research is the latter's acceptance of the idea that being personal and subjective is a motor, an engine of the research, Rather than attempting to keep personal perspectives outside the laboratory, artists willingly bring that perspective to bear on decision-making during the process itself. An interesting observation might be to notice the many ways artists build permeable membranes around the personal so that it can be accessed, assessed without allowing it to dominate. And I'll just read you one last little thought about this. Artists have been researching forever. Maybe we called it different things. Maybe we didn't talk about it. Perhaps we didn't even notice it. Certainly, with all the emphasis on the final outcome, there was no reason to make it available. Somehow, I think, with the cultural changes all around us, including a new emphasis on process, creativity, cross-transdisciplinary practices, we are finding that our various approaches to research begin to matter not just to us within artistic circles, but to those beyond. I consider this an incredible opportunity. Okay, so I'm going to pause. <laughs> I'd actually love to show you some of the new research I'm doing. Um, let, let, let me do that really quickly, and then Jim's coming up. Um, just because I, I, I really... I'm really excited about this. This, this is um, uh, two, uh, two scientists talking at, uh, at Harvard. They're on a team working on PTSD. And one of them is a former vet who's joined the team, and one is a scientist. And I'm going to show you a little bit of their language, and then I'll show you just a little bit of what we did with it in, uh, in this, uh, yeah, how we played with it. So here's this. In addition to this, this acceleration, deceleration injury that you can have, you also have this, this impact of a pressure pulse. So when an explosive device goes off, it creates this, this massive pressure wave. There's this very quick explosive wave that happens. Like when a blast goes off, it compresses the air so quickly. So it essentially passes over you very quickly and, and, and impacts the body, travels through, and actually is transmitted to the brain. Um, and, and one of the key questions surrounding TBI is how does that pressure pulse itself um, possibly cause damage inside the brain? A lot of these uh, soldiers, Marines, would come back and... Okay, so that's a little bit of them talking. So that what we're doing is we're experimenting with a series of the audience event. Uh, their things happen to them in the lobby, but then they go into the theater. They go to the back of the theater where we're going to put on exhibit different characters. So the, all the characters you're going to see later on stage are on exhibit. You can go and see them. And uh, this is one of the early ideas. We, we experimented with this, and we had this in a room when we did a work in progress showing of this. And honestly, once people came into this room, they did not want to leave this room. The way it was set up, you'll just see the artist, the, the, the performer, but the, the two scientists you just saw were on monitors in there as well. It, it, it's, it, well, you'll see. Yeah, so we found um, that a lot of these uh, soldiers were needing to come back and they would, they would have had multiple instances of like moderate to mild traumatic brain injury. So at the severest levels, yeah, I mean, if you get it and there's something sticking out of you and you, you, know, you, you are just, you know, you passed out and you're, you've got a concussion, um, they'll, they'll send you back you know, to the back lines and, and, and Put you together, and a lot of times you would just build. So you know, they the gave US. us these and there's this films other space where it could, of these you know, explosions. Blast. So you were in a Humvee, um, and an explosion went off, and you know maybe your your buddy next to you got to pretty pretty bad, but you were sitting. Yeah. On so that's um, one version of it, and Jim and I'll talk for a while, and maybe we'll end with the other version of what we're doing. So Jim, you want to come up? Yeah. Thanks. Maybe I can start by saying thank you, Liz, for oh. sharing all of that with all of us on behalf of everyone in the audience. Thanks. 
Um, uh, so I, uh, just to let everyone in on the conversations we've been having, we, we met last evening and we spent a little bit of time together this, uh, before uh, tonight. And um, I, I mentioned uh, that I really wanted to approach this uh, by having uh, an opportunity to respond very much to what Liz was saying as opposed to you know, setting any, uh, any questions or making it uh, fixed in any sort of fashion. And, and I guess with that in mind, I, if at any point in time anybody would like to participate, there's a microphone that is roaming around somewhere. Or will be. And if you throw up your hand, please feel free to jump into the conversation. I think the microphone might just be emerging right now. Hey, uh, so, so responding a bit to what, uh, responding a lot to what we heard you say, um, I was fascinated when you spoke about uh, your parents and uh, the environment that it created for you, uh, sharing with us what it was like to be a young person and emerging and how we changed through life. And of course, I was um, curious to know, what advice would you give to the young version of yourself today? Uh, well, um, actually, I only give advice when asked. That's one thing. Cause I, so are I, you saying the younger you, the younger you wouldn't have been open to advice? Uh, no, I think that, um, I, think young, I think people want to work it out. Um, but if they have a question, I'm happy to answer it. And or if I know something. But the thing I feel really strongly about is, is learning how to break rules, including learning how to break the rules of the people that you think are supposed to like you. It's really hard. It's easy, you know, I have an essay in the book, it's easy to be against President Bush, but it's much harder to be against your friends. It's, it's like, how do you learn to stand up to, um, like my experience about dance was that it wasn't all abstract all the time, but everybody was telling me it's abstract, it's, you know, that was like the rule. And honestly, it just didn't feel like that to me. But it took me so long to get brave enough to say, wait a second, I think I'm going to, you know, actually, it took going, isolating myself in a senior center for 10 years <laughs> to get strong enough to actually say that. So I, the, the issue for me is how do you break rules? Because I think that young people are burdened by even the postmodern rules, which I love and I helped build. Interesting. Thank you very much. The, uh, y y your career has been a remarkable journey. I mean, you, you presented the, the origins and the work that you're on to right now. The, I'm curious whether or not uh, you mentioned uh, that the work that you were doing, the piece that came along after your mother's death, that it, you never thought about it as uh, art therapy for yourself. But I'm curious, do you ever consider yourself as an art therapist for others? Well, I'm actually challenging the word therapy right now. It, it kind of bothers me. Um, and among the things that bothers me about it is that I can use the same tools with the dancers in the company as I use with, say, older people somewhere. Um, why is one therapy and one not? And I think it's because we think the damaged people or the victims or the, the voiceless or all those terms we give to people somehow make it therapy when in my mind we're just making art. So... Um, I do think there is a time, there are extreme therapeutic situations, and I, and I know artists who are working in them. I don't know if they call themselves therapists or not. I like to think that the contract is just really different. So if you're in a contracted relationship involving therapy, then my job is to make you feel better. But if we're making art together, my job is to help us make the best art we can make, and by the way, you will feel better especially if we work hard. And all of the research is showing this to be true. That it doesn't, like with old people, for example, there, there, there's some amazing studies about older people who, are, uh, who get involved in the arts, and if they are challenged and it's rigorous, then they stop going to the doctor, they, they don't take as much medicine, they're, you know. But it's that challenge and rigor. And, that, the nurture, and there's a way to do that in a nurturing framework, I guess so. That. Yeah. 
the notion of the continuum. I, I love this idea very much. Yeah, I, it's, I think it's really interesting. You know, the other thing I would say, there's a, one of the old men that I worked with at the Roosevelt Hotel, really old guy, big guy. He was a former naval commander. And we did this, um, we, uh, it was my beginning as a choreographer. We were making dances about their lives, and we went into the schools. And we had one about, one of our men was a, a wood chopper from northern Michigan. And the dance, <laughs> the old people lined up. They got up their axes. They went one, two, three, timber, and then they all fell down, which the children adored. They just couldn't get enough of all these old people falling down. Well, <laughs> it was pretty funny. And then, one, then John, this guy, this naval commander, came up to me after about a month of this, and he said, I, Liz, I want you to know I've taken a bath. And I was like, okay, good. No, he said, no, no, it's really important. He said, I've only been taking showers for the last five years because I can't get up and down. But now that I've been a tree falling down, I can figure out how to get it up and down in the tub. Okay, so what I love about this is this guy would never go to therapy, not even occupational therapy. There's no word you could give it that would make this guy go and get help. And that, that, that is so powerful to me. And, that's, and in return, remember, be art in service to... Um, I'm still telling the story 30 years later, so. The, um, a bit of a conversation that Liz and I had before, which we're going to bring you into right now, uh, only because Liz just sort of said that she's been, she's still telling the story 30 years later. And it's, um, uh, one of the things that I was curious about is uh, we, we live in a society, and certainly in a sector of the art world, I think, we're victims to uh, fashionable language. There's always new terminology to somehow describe what we're doing. And one of the questions I was putting to Liz was, has what you're doing or what we are doing in the artistic field actually changed as much as the language or theory would make us think? Or are we in an era where we are uh, you know, um, refashioning, repackaging, representing, reframing ideas that have actually been around for some time? Um, you know, I sometimes I laugh about this idea about older people dancing because some people think, you know, well, Liz, you, you know, you really got that started. Well, actually, old people have been dancing for thousands of years. I mean, we just forgot about it for a while in the West in a certain form of dance, and then we started again just because. And again, I wasn't the only person thinking about that at that time. So I think a lot of it, of course, is reworking. But you know, again, this is where this idea of understanding both both sides of a story. Like, I think it's really interesting when people change the language because I feel they're trying to get us to see something in a new way. They want us to approach it in a fresh way. Like, we were talking about the word community and that it's not a helpful term anymore. We should be finding all kinds of new language for that. It will help us be fresh and not just bring everything with us. By the same token, I think under... If we were better at acknowledging our forebears, I think it would be a good thing in the arts for us to do that. I, like if people were willing to say, I'm basing this on this. I've been influenced by that. And I think one reason we don't do that is because we still operate with this myth that genius is somehow born in you and just happens. And uh, nobody wants to, to see that actually that genius has been nurtured and nurtured and nurtured by all these experiences. So I think it would be wonderful if we could acknowledge where things come from. I think that would be great. And also rename them if that's going to help us. Um, but as to whether things are really changing right this minute among the kind of art that, I mean, I think what we're seeing is a lot of um, uh, um, permeability that as forms blend is where we're going to see it. And maybe some people don't think that's new. I think it's really interesting, actually. The, your, the curiosity of your career, which you alluded to, um, and uh, I've spent a bit of time reading about Liz this past weekend, and, and uh, your voracious appetite to uh, find collaborators from other disciplines uh, seems to go on and on and on. I'm curious, as, we, um, as you reference the idea of uh, footnoting or referencing where we have been influenced in the artistic world, I would expect in many disciplines that's a standard accepted um, uh, required sort of process. And I'm curious in, that, in the contrast of you know, the arts discipline versus other disciplines, 
What are the other um, bigger factors that you see that make us different or somehow uh, that, that contrasts the artistic world from, say, the scientific world? Yeah. Um, I'm going to draw on my experience with the scientists to kind of help explain this. Uh, and it, there, there are two stories that I like to think about. And there are also many ways we're the same. So, like, we're the same because we're obsessive. We're the same because we, uh, you know, we'll stick to something for a very long time. We're the same because I think we like tedium. There's a certain way that tedium is kind of satisfying, just the going and going and going and going, and you know you're kind of resting while you're waiting for something fantastic to happen. That's where it's the same. But <clears throat> when, I got, when I started working with the geneticists, um, I had a team of scientists that were willing to be my advisors. So I was desperately like reading, trying to find stuff that we could work on in the studio. And I came across this term protein folding. And I decided, oh, I got excited, oh, a verb. <laughs> we'll, we'll have something to do. <laughs> I'll take protein folding into the studio. So I wrote all the scientists and said in my email, what do you think about protein folding? So I got back from one of them right away. Um, How did you land on protein folding? That's like the biggest thing in our field. How did you do that so fast? And Another one wrote back and said, don't work on protein folding. It's a way too complicated. Stick to the ethics. Was, so I love that I got those two reactions. But meanwhile, we did work on it. Um, one of the dancers wanted to know, was this one fold or was it infinite folds? Which I sent back to the scientists. And one of them wrote back and said, welcome to our world, which I thought was pretty great. But when I finally saw an animation of protein folding, I didn't think it was protein folding. Like, I would describe it as something like a slow wrapping tightly around itself uh, falling to the, to the ground. Now, of course, it was a particular animation, but I wouldn't have called it folding. It, it was much more like a, a spiraling wrapping kind of tightening thing. So I went back to the scientist and said, well, wait a minute, why do you call this protein folding? And you now here's like the hipster thing. It's a really cool word. It's cool. They like the word. And they all latched on it like that. Well, I would say from an artistic point of view, the ability to hold multiple ideas about, it's multiple words for the same thing, multiple ways to see the same thing, to me as an artistic tool. If they, protein folding could be one, but if they came up with 20 different ways to describe it, and if they all agreed to keep all 20 of them for like say five years, I suspect their research would be different because I think you're affected if your imagination is saying protein folding. I think you're going to ask questions that relate. To, see, so that's what I mean about that. That, they're, that we have these tools that we don't, we don't even realize we have until we start investigating them. That's one of them that I'm profoundly interested in. And the other one I alluded to in the writing, which is the use of the personal. I, I taught a class at Wesleyan University where I. Um, I had three science partners, astronomer, a cosmologist, and a physicist, and they provided the content for the students, but I provided the research methods. So all the research was going to be done through artistic practice. All the content was from the scientists, and I didn't even understand most of the content. I, I didn't know it. So the first assignment was the students had to pick one of the three. and. Uh, then, once they had picked them, they, I told them they had to come up with a personal story for why they picked that, that person. So one of the boys talked about how he, his family had gone to the laundromat to do the laundry, was hot where they lived, so they would go at night. He picked the astronomer. He said, we would be at the laundromat, I, the laundry's going, I'd go outside, sit, look up, right? You totally get how, what that would be like, right? And completely understand. And then the next assignment was, okay, now you have to come up with a question to ask your teacher that comes from the personal story. And th they balked a little. They said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you could go ask the astronomer, how does the universe clean itself? Right? Do you see? That's an interesting question. Now, I'm sure the astronomer had some answers about that, but I probably because it was posed that way, maybe it would have clicked something in his mind, too. So those are some of the ways in which I think we have something to contribute. Interesting. And um, the, cu uh, the curiosity about unearthing these things that, um, as artists, you may have available to you but may not acknowledge or recognize, how do your peers view this uh, concept or this um, idea? I'm sorry, can I ask that again? I'm, uh, I'm curious, as you, as, you, um, uh, as you look specifically at notions of uh, 
you know, research, things that we've always been doing in an artistic practice, but maybe have not, you know, found the right word for it, documented it quite in the same way. Uh, but you seem to be on a bit of a mission to unearth this as an yeah, idea. Yeah, actually, it would be fun to find out from some of the students today who are in class, because we did it ad nauseum in class, did we not? And I kept saying to you, and why are you doing that? And why did you do that? And why did you do that? Because I just believe so strongly that we have all this intuitive knowledge that once we give it um, a name. Now, here's where I think people get a little terrified. They think I'm, quote, a reductionist, that I have now reduced this down to like a singular thing. But quite the contrary. What I find is that if you can repeat the thing you did um, and then test it and test it and test it and test it, it actually is like a gem. You keep finding new, new sides to it and it just sparkles more and more. It doesn't, it doesn't feel reduced to me. But I'm very interested in that. I, I know a lot of my artistic colleagues are not. I think people are afraid of the, that they'll lose the mystery. But I, I find it deeply mysterious. Actually, we should turn to the audience. Is there anybody who wants to pose a question at this time? Up oh, there's a hand over there. Oh, we've got Am on mic deal, detail. Thank you, Am. <laughs> Um, we're uh, asking everyone to speak in the mic because we're capturing it's this It's like we're on Oprah posterior. or something. That's it, exactly. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, you say what? <laughs> uh, thank you, Liz. Great, great talk. This is fascinating. And I think, I think one of the reasons that we're reluctant to do this, I was just thinking about it and I was trying to figure out why, why don't we harness these things? Because I, I also agree it's incredibly important and fascinating. And a lot of researchers have tried to do this over the years and we're just trying to figure out a language for our process. But I think it's because we're... we're having to always, for many years, defend what we do. So it's, it's this weird pressure where we feel like, well, why do, you, why do you dance and what are you making and, and, and what do you mean by that? Well, I don't have to mean anything. I'm an artist. I don't have to mean anything. I'm a dancer. I just do this. And Do you know what I mean? I think there... I do. You know. And I've been thinking a lot about that. And I'm so glad you raised it because I know what you mean and it's really frustrating. Yeah. But I think there's a difference between justification and inquiry. Yeah. Yeah. The justifying is awful. Yeah. Nobody wants to justify. It puts us on the defensive immediately. Well, I think we also don't see the importance of the inquiry. I think it's great that you make that distinction because it really is important. We're just trying to understand that, I think. But, um, but yeah, that is the distinction. I think you're right. Yeah, and, and I think, too, if it's not the right question or a question that is, um, brings about an enthusiasm, then I would say ask a different one. Let's go find another one. But, but I, um, I just think there's so much in there that, uh, you know, is to be excavated. Yeah. Another question from the floor? Oh, Liz, as a um, scientist who's had an opportunity to work with dancers, I can say it's been um, profoundly impacting a lot of change in how I look at the science that I did. But I'm curious about the responses you've had from other scientists, has it, as much as it's changed your perceptions and your, as many things as you've noticed, is it um, going two ways? Do you see the scientists you're working with really changing, broadening, doing anything different after they're uh, done working with you? I, I actually, I see some changes in uh, some of their educational the way they teach, which is much more open-ended, um, much more sort of part, um, participatory in a way. Um, I think we're getting somewhere with this language thing and this holding open multiple names, that kind of thing. I'd love to be in a laboratory with a scientist and see what really would go on at the research level. But I also want to say in reverse, I've been affected by the scientists. And one of the ways, and I know I'm going to, this is makes a lot of people just squirm, but because um, we've been measured, we've been attempting to measure and measure and measure, and we keep feeling like we have to justify ourselves with measurement. But I actually think a lot of the scientists I'm, ar I'm around have a way of evaluating and measuring what they're doing that's fascinating, really creative, and we, we could learn from it. And again, I'll tell you a story. I was at Harvard. They had a day on innovation and teaching and learning. I was part of, they broke up into teams, and I was in a team with three other innovating faculty. And we did our, we each got 10 minutes. And 
I decided to work with the person who went before me, so he was a Chinese scholar, so we worked with the content that he'd already done, and we did some moving things with it, which I won't go into, but people loved it, and they had a great time. They were really excited. And then after me went two more people who also did really interesting things, and then they showed little graphs at the end of their presentation about how the students had done on tests with this new way of working. So the buzz at the end of the day was everybody was just talking about the dancing. I mean, people were just ecstatic. They couldn't, uh, and I, I got hopeful. I thought, oh good, they're gonna let me come back and we're gonna work on experiential learning. This is gonna be great. So a week later, I get on the phone with the people who ran the conference, fully expecting them to wanna talk about how we could do this. Instead, all this resistance had sunk in. Oh, we can't do it. So I listened to what their issues were about it, and I realized that they couldn't remember what happened. They didn't have any language for their experience. They hadn't practiced saying anything about it. And even though it had been splendid, there was no way to grasp it. What they could do was they could remember all those graphs. They completely got that. So I started to think, not only were the graphs um, helping people notice the experience, but it was a way to file it. Like they had more trust in the, in the bars. Well, just more rehearsal with that than they had with having had the experience that they could no longer account for. So that really got me thinking about the nature of, of how, we, um, how we describe what happens to us, how we of where we put it, how we file it, how we draw on it again. So with Origins, which we didn't talk about, but this piece that I did it with a physicist, we actually got a National Science Foundation grant um, for the project, and they were interested in finding out what the audience was getting. So we embedded research all throughout the whole experience, which actually turned out to be a lot of fun. We did a lot of crazy things to do it. We have a lot of interesting um, outcomes from what our audiences got from it. And one outcome that I love is that all the women, by and large women of all ages, got so much more out of science <laughs> by seeing it through bodies that honestly I feel like you could just say to every you know, second grade school, and just if you start teaching science with dance, we'll have more female scientists. But, but I guess my point is just that in reverse mark that we, we in the arts, I think we could be thinking better about measuring ourselves, not outsiders, not trying to prove, just finding out ways to describe it. Scanning out on the floor, full purpose here. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Hi, Liz. I have a, I have a short uh, a curiosity on, um, you mentioned that you invited three scientists to work with your students, and those students are in dance. Uh, no, they were, well, they were from all across the, the uh -huh. university. So there were maybe two people in the class were dancers, but the others were from other fields. There was a visual artist, and two of them were just taking the course because they were interested. Do they change their perspectives about the relationship of science and their own story after the experience or after the assignment and, or project? I think that if they were here, they would tell you that they rethought what, how they came to know things what knowledge was to them and how they formed that. I think mm -hmm. that's probably the main thing they would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. Looking out to the floor once more. Oh, there we go. Um, Liz, you spoke at the start about uh, rattling around in other people's universes, and I, I think that's a, a common thing for people who have an inquisitive mind. Um, at what point did you feel like that wandering combined with your capacity to be uh, reflective on, on what you were doing began to actually manifest in your own universe and started to bring other people into that space? Did, was there a point where you noticed that happening? And if so, did that then change how you thought about what you do or your practice or your sense of responsibility towards what you were doing? You know, I think it's a really interesting question. I don't know that I can figure out when, but I think um, 
first I began to hear from people who were not dancers who wished they could spend time at the dance exchange. Rabbis or scientists or people who wished they could get a fellowship and just spend time there. So that was a significant sense that they were be people were beginning to experience something that way that was powerful. But I think a lot of my time has been spent actually with other arts people in general, dance people in particular, to try to open up other people's processes too. Um, to, to, to believe that we have so much more to offer than the narrow ways, well, my characterization, the narrow ways that the profession had defined itself. And that um, we were, um, we could be so much more generous about what we know. And I'm not sure, and this is part of the discussion that we were having, I don't know why that's been such a hard battle, that why it feels somehow um, unpure to take the, you know, to take on the world in a way with, with, with our art. Whether it's through community engagement projects or social justice projects or um, dances about the military like I'm doing, there, there are thousands of ways that we could be doing it. And in some ways that's the spot where I still feel a lot of um, um, push on my part. And if, if that's answering your question, I don't think I've achieved it yet. Um, I do think there's been some shifts and changes, and you know, it's. I'm. I'm. I think one reason I'm talking so much about creative research right now is that I feel like we could drop some of the oppositional nature we keep setting up. Oh, this this very thing I set up myself, like drop it and just say there's a convergence going on. Let's appreciate that and let's work with it. But um, I'm not sure there was a single moment. I, I will say that, um, it's funny, I mostly don't think much about the awards that I've gotten, but I will say that the MacArthur makes people think twice sometimes when they're around me. And that some of that battling that I was working so hard, I don't have to battle quite so, hard, so much. People are willing to say, well, maybe, maybe she's got something there. Something like that. And that, that may have been a turning point, or maybe that was just a turning point in my own mind. I don't know. Does your writing, or do your desire to write, uh, have any relationship to that? Oh, that's really interesting. You know, I, was, I told Jim earlier today, I wrote that book because nobody else was writing. Um, we were talking about Jawale Zoller, this amazing woman that I, I'm collaborating with right now. And... Um, we both feel that there's a, there's a huge part of the, um, the dance world that we've been occupying that people just don't even know about. And that the writing was in part an attempt to just make sure people knew something about it at some point. Um, yeah, I've quite enjoyed actually doing the writing. Uh, it's been really interesting to get to do that. A question down here. And I'm curious while we're waiting for the mic to move, uh, Liz, can you tell us a bit about critical response? Wow. <laughs> Do you guys know about it? Critical response process? People are using it a little bit? Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it's having like a, a renaissance all of a sudden. It sort of was sort of operating and now it seems to be back. Critical response is a, is a um, process for giving feedback that, um, again, it's one of those examples. My own experience told me that what was, a, what was called feedback wasn't good enough, and that there, there had to be a better way to do this. And it was mostly that I was suffering as an artist in the sense that I didn't think I was getting better because of what people were telling me, and I was suffering as a person going into, like today, going into classrooms like today, and like assuming that I was just gonna tell everybody you know, how good their work was. So coming, coming to grips with another way to do that has been, was, Exciting, I'm glad I did it. And then I think I might have fallen by the wayside like a lot of things that I've done, but John Borstel, who still who co-wrote the book with me, he is like the shepherd. And because someone else shepherded it, I think it it's really has a life now, which is kind of exciting. If we had more time, we could talk about 
my perception now, for those of you who know it, we focus so much on the artists, but I'm focusing much more now on the responders, and I really feel like there's an incredible way that any critical response session can give a responder a really um, interesting hour of self-reflection <laughs> that I'm trying to pull forward more now. Uh, so just to say that uh, another way or to make sure that I heard it right, that the people that are responding are potentially learning as much as the subject. Yeah. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. On to the question. Hi. Uh, my name is Miriam. Hi, Liz. Um, a bit of a tangent, but so I grew up in Washington, D.C., so when you talk about it, it brings this place to mind. and. Um, I've lived for the last nine years and worked and created and researched in a small town in northern BC, and now I'm down in Vancouver for a little bit. And I know that you've worked all over the world, and so my question is, a, I have this curiosity about how place has influenced your work. And you mentioned belonging at the beginning, I have this images of your, yeah, I'm just really curious about that intersection. Probably the place that I worked the longest was the Roosevelt Hotel, which was 10 years. And um, it enormous impact, obviously, on my life. And maybe the three years that I taught at the Sandy Spring Friends School, which was also such a place, and I lived on the campus, and I, I learned so many things by being in that community. But otherwise, I feel like... Um, uh, I count on my capacity to listen to the people that I'm with or to see the world exactly where I am, the, the, the environment, as the thing that helps me do the work less than the fact that I might be there for a long period of time because I travel so much. But on if each place is unique, I'm also so aware that there's certain things that are common that come up over and over and over and over and over again, no matter where I am in the world. For example, people feeling they don't belong to their own neighborhoods anymore. They, and when we did the Hallelujah Project, which was 15 communities, um, uh, it didn't matter whether it was Los Angeles or rural Maine. We kept hearing the same thing. Somebody's taking over my neighborhood. And, or my street, or my, I just don't know where I am anymore. So that, that was interesting to me, that there would be like that kind of common question. The last thing I'll just say about place is less about place and more about touring, and why I wish touring would not go away like it is. I, I so wish that everyone could have the opportunity that I had to tour, because audiences are different. And work that you think lives like this, it's totally different in another part. And audiences don't respond at all the same way. And um, I wish that dance artists in particular had a chance to work that through and to get to do a piece over and over and over and to reiterate it. I know that's not quite what you're asking, but, but that is a, a, a thing I really feel sad about. So. I'm just going to insert a question. There may be another one, but um, I'm glad you mentioned the Alleluia Project, which is, uh, for everyone's benefit, a project that happened around the turn of the century, the millennial year, and was undertaken in a number of different communities. And, and I feel like you've half answered the question, but I want to push a bit deeper because um, your experience of going from a community to community to community, uh, I, I hear you saying how the, um, they are all different, as audiences are all different. But I'm curious, can you speak to how communities are similar, recognizing that as a basic proposition for the work that you're doing, you're making some assumptions about going in and being able to work with a group of people. And I'm curious, can you speak at all about the commonalities of those communities? Well, I thought Harvard was an awful lot like the shipyard. And that interested me, that surprised me. That, um, but. What made me say that was that people at big institutions um, are ecstatic if somebody walks in the door and wants to listen to what they do. They can't believe it, whether it's a welder or whether it's the head of the history department at one of the top universities. You're interested in, in me? That really, that, that's, and that I think is, so our ability to really listen and then 
to maybe transform these stories into something else that they can see. Or in, And then, of course, now we're into a whole big question about who owns that story and how much can you change the story and all that, but which we won't get into now. But, but I, I, I think that that deep listening, which we worked on a little bit today in class because it's not always listening to the language, it's listening to the movement, it's listening to the, um, the tone of the body, it's listening, all that stuff begins to, to come out. I, I think my home is actually the art-making practice. That's the home, and all these places are like test sites. Maybe that sounds cold, but I think that's really the case. And in that sense, um, I'm back to my mom and myself, and it's about the evolution of this self and this way of thinking, and that all of these people have contributed. So let me just say, the I'm working with the veteran, these veterans right now have come back from our wars, and. Um, one thing that veterans have when they're in, when they're fighting, or they're in a battle, or they're serving their country, is purpose. They have purpose. So when they come home, they have no purpose. So where is their purpose? Well, rehearsals. A purpose. I mean, it's sort of back again, Rob, to what you were saying about we don't want to justify ourselves, but we have so much purpose. In some ways, I think these, these events, these gatherings, these things that we do when we, when we pull people together, we, we have a meeting and then there's a dance made from it, or maybe you, it's purposeful. It makes people feel like they, and in some cases, they feel like they're helping me, like the veterans who come out to work with me. It's all about helping Liz, right? We're going to help you make that dance. You know, we're going we're to do that. And that's interesting, but they will also travel hundreds of miles to help uh, a, a comrade do their research or, you know, if they have to go get their, their brain scans or something like that. So I, I think that's interesting. That's like another whole layer of what we're doing and, of course, it's providing purpose for me as well. Just looking out to you. Oh, here we go. Hello, Please. Liz. Um, yeah. Well, I was interested in uh, ownership of stories and... <laughs> yeah. um, and you said we won't... Well, we can do it. That would be great, and uh, specifically in relationship to like you investigating, listening to these stories, making dance, and they own them. There's creativity. How and how does that transfer into the science world, where ownership is also very important? It's really, it's really interesting. But the scientists and Marcus here can help us think about this too. The scientists have evolved some amazing systems of, of, of collaboration and partnership and acknowledgement. Uh, in some ways, I think they're way ahead of us in that regard. Um, but as to, and they also have, of course, all kinds of protocols about what they can do with their research subjects, which we don't have. We don't have those protocols, which I'm actually glad we don't have protocols. I just think we need to really be incredibly sensitive, articulate, and transparent. So it doesn't a rule, like every single time I'm going to do this. But we used to, we would have systems, like we had the 24-hour rule. We'll go, we'll listen to stories. People have 24 hours to go back, check with their families, find out if we can use the story or not. And very, uh, there were many times when they come back and say, no, you can't have the story. That's fine. But we would have had the story among us, and that, that was interesting. We, had a, we worked with a tribal group. Um, he wanted to talk about shape-shifting, which the tribe used to be able to do. And uh, he went and talked to his elders, and uh, he got the okay, which was amazing to me, that he came back and we were able to talk about it. And that was amazing. There are also people who tell the stories, and they go home and check with their families, and it turns out there's way more to the story. <laughs> way more, and then they come back with a new story which is what happened in Japan over these charm belts that they wore during the war. A thousand stitches on each belt, each stitch made by a different woman, and the Japanese soldiers would wear these. I got really interested in that, went to Japan, did a project. Didn't know I had walked into a hornet's nest of issues. It turns out that the young people hated those belts because they thought their parents were so stupid to believe that that would charm would work. So one of the women came back having confronted her family about this 
And her mother told her, well, it wasn't like that. We put our blood in it. So they were pricking themselves and putting blood into that. Their hair, their pubic hair. They, they, I mean, there were so many stories about these belts that had not come out. The group decided how much to tell and how much not to tell. And that seemed great to me. And that's one of those places where I think sometimes our competing ideas about art making become problematic. Because if the artist is the sole generator and it's all about me and I make those decisions and I'm the one, like, you know, no art by committee. Well, actually, I think art by committee is really interesting. I think you can do a lot of art by committee. Remember, it's so sometimes I retain the right to absolutely make all those decisions, and sometimes I'm completely willing to give them all up. But it's not compromising to give them up. It's another thing, right? I think we'll take one last question, if there is one. There it is. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. I'm not in the arts. But I use your response, critical response feedback when I teach second year doctoral students about research. So it's, I was so excited when you came to see you were coming. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, you said something about the term community, and you said many things about some terms we use, and it's kind of beaten up. Yeah. It's been used so much and stretched, it's, it's kind of lost its yeah. uh, elasticity, I guess. And I wondered if, because we, I'm very interested in community engagement, do you have some new, like protein wrapping? Is it protein <laughs> twirling? I, you know, I, I think it really, it would be wonderful for us to all uh, re-dig into it. I was telling Jim that the origins for me, myself, had very much to do with uh, asking myself the question that uh, in this hierarchy that at one end there's art that's so good it has nothing to do with anything. It's really fantastic. It's its, its own thing. And then there's art at the under, at other end of the spectrum that is so embedded in its community that we don't even call it art. And that I was very interested in that particular spectrum and I found myself living down here. I was trained in this one art that's so separate, the more separate it is, the better it is. But I had yearnings for something that was going on over here, which is, of course, what I found in the senior center. And at that time, in 1975, the idea that, quote, you could, I was interested in how you actually could build a community that would last for a little bit of time and then let it dissolve. And so the word had real meaning to me around this idea of, uh, of my bereftness, in a way. But then over time, it obviously it's come to mean a million things, and uh, some of it uh, negative. So I don't have new language. I only have that we should be as specific as we can about what we're doing in the given moment and see what we can develop. But if we're troubled by it, the thing I think most is we should ask each other, what do you mean? So when the word therapy comes up, what do you mean? If the word community, what do you mean by that? Just in, in the most generous way we can, what do you mean? And I suspect in that very moment, people will come up with a language that is right for them. And we could start thinking about that. I know we were joking because we started, we, we dropped the outreach word a long time ago because we felt it was so, it had implications that were incorrect. We started using that word engagement because we really were engaged, but now it's just simply been transferred to all of that, so it's not a very good word either, is it? So um, let's interview each other and find out. <laughs> Great, and on that, thank you so much, Liz, for everything this thank evening. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Anne.